Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm glad that so many of you have decided to stay in Grey Driech, Edinburgh, which seems to be generating its own weather system today. I came down from, as typically the case, the Balmy Highlands yesterday and clear blue skies, even at Dromochter and 25 Celsius plus. Um, so I was slightly worried that a lot of you would have hightailed it out of the city. So thank you for your dedication and welcome to, would you believe it, the 60th AGM of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. That's quite a figure to conjure with in mind. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'd just like to say hello first. I'm Kenny Taylor, um, Chair of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and I took over from Linda Rosborough this time last year. I'll come back with some um, rambling reminiscences, both personal and general, about uh, the Trust just shortly. But first off, essentially, uh, essential details, I'll hand over to Rashir Shah, who's going to tell us a little bit of things for our safety and comfort during the day. Rashir. Hello, so my name is Rachir Shah, I'm the Director of External Affairs at the Scottish Wildlife Trust and I just uh, would like to say a few things so that you can uh, have a very comfortable and exciting stay here at, for the day, for both the morning session and for those of you staying on in the afternoon session today. So uh, just in terms of some basics, just in terms of fire safety, there are no drills, no fire drills and just so you're aware, if there is uh, an emergency fire, there will be staff that come in but the exits are on either side here. If you do go through that exit, it's simply turn left and go through the glass doors that were the entrance that you came in. And uh, if, it, if you go through this route, you can also just go straight down uh, through the corridor to the end and you'll be able to exit into the same place. And the fire assembly point is literally just outside the, the glass entrance that you came in uh, for the museum. Um, in terms of uh, what, one thing I'd, I'd like to just kind of uh, uh, mention is that the lift that we have in this part of the museum is currently out of order. So apologies for that. It is being fixed and we're hoping it'll be fixed during the course of this morning. So I will advise later on if, if uh, the lift is available. So for now, if there is, uh, uh, if you do need to kind of get around the museum, please use the stairs. Also, just to note that um, if you are on another level, uh, if there is a fire, please obviously use the stairs to come down. And if you have got any mobility issues with the stairs, there are refuge points in, in the stairwell itself with a call point where you can actually pick uh, a press a button and call for assistance as well. So, so just, just to, to explain that. In terms of other facilities, there are toilets just literally uh, next to the entrance here on the left. So if you come out this door here and turn to the left, go to the end, it's right there just on the left of the, um, the entrance, the, the glass entrance there. Um, and of course, being the museum, there are facilities throughout the museum on all levels as well. Um, also, I'd like to just mention that this morning session is being live streamed. There are, there is, there are members that are joining us online through Zoom. Um, and um, just so you're aware that that is taking place. Uh, and, if, and the afternoon session uh, later on will be recorded as well. Um, but this, this morning session, the AGM is being live streamed. I would like to invite those on the online Zoom, uh, feel free to use the chat facility and say hello, uh, but also use the question and answer panel that you'll find uh, in the Zoom screen that you're in to submit any questions that you would like to use during the, 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 the morning session. You can also look at what other people have asked and upvote if you're online those questions. Uh, we'll take a selection of questions from the room and from the Zoom uh, question and answer as well. Other thing to be aware of is there are uh, because we're partnering with the museum today, there are free family activities happening in partnership with the museum between 11 to 1 and 2 to 3. These are all taking place uh, right at the top on level 4 in the museum. You can get there either through uh, by going back up through here to the, to the room where the coffees and refreshments were and then coming out and going up one flight of stairs. Or you can go the same route by going through the escalators which are in the main part of the museum. There is unfortunately one flight of stairs that you would need to go through there. So if, if you have got any mobility concerns, be aware that level four does require at least going up one flight of stairs. Uh, you are of course welcome to come and go between the auditorium and the rest of the museum uh, whenever you feel like, but please make sure if you have any children, I can't see any children in the audience here at the moment, but if there are any, uh, please ensure that they are accompanied at all times. 
So that's me for now, and I'll, I'll speak to you later on. Thank you. Back to you, Kenny. Thanks very much, Richard. And at least we know that the person stuck in the lift can live stream, so that's all right. Um, okay, yeah, those of you, and I hope many of you, will be able to stay for our members' afternoon, really, part of, of the day when we'll be you know, taking stock of, of different aspects of many different things. But, of course, as I said at the start, a 60th anniversary sounds like a rather big one. And to put that in some context and to focus minds, a proportion of people in the room will think back to uh, 1960. Another proportion definitely won't. Um, but some of the things that jumped out at me uh, in terms of looking at what were notable things during 1960 include that, for example, both Michelle Obama and Kamala Harris were born in 1960 as was our current First Minister, John Swinney. I'll leave out some of the politicians that were also born in that year that I don't so much agree with, but um, anyway, there are others available in that. And as you might have seen in recent coverage, the Fourth Road Bridge was officially opened um, in 1960. The anniversary was just about three days ago or so. Um, for the Trust, small beginnings, we were but halfway through the party for, the, for what's now the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts, which was formed way back in 1912 um, by one of the Rothschilds, who interestingly, I think, had a vision that what was important was thinking at a landscape scale and the importance also of preservation of, of species that were under pressure. So some of those ideas, I think, are still as current as they were back in 1912. And for the trust, for the Scottish Wildlife Trust, then I think um, many aspects of that sort of thinking have continued since. So through the years, and I'm not going to um, you know, go through um, doggedly decades and things, but some of you will know some of the highlights of really what in some cases would be thought of as a relatively small organisation back then, thinking big and acting big. My own personal um, engagement with the Wildlife Trust included not really knowing that I was on a Scottish Wildlife Trust reserve when I used to go into the campsies via Balagan, Balagan Spout and up those amazing layers of deep time. Um, you know the quotes and things from, from James Hutton. Well, that's a place where you can see the layers writ large through the millions of years. And I used to go up there to try and see peregrines in the Campsie Fells when I was young and when um, actually peregrines were hanging on in the greater Glasgow and even inner Glasgow area when they'd disappeared from lots of other places. There's a lovely story, uh, well, maybe not so lovely depending on how you think of it, but um, there's peregrines back in one of the towers of Glasgow University now seeing, and they were there then, um, and there's a story apocryphal really little old lady it's always a little old lady either in English or in Gaelic it's remarkable how often literally old ladies feature in place names because they were the last person left in a cave somewhere but anyway there was this aforesaid little old lady making her way along our Gyle Street when a headless pigeon dropped to her feet um, luckily she didn't need too much um, attention from emergency services but basically this was one of the the peregrines that had come in and knocked the head off, it mishit a pigeon uh, above central Glasgow. And that sort of thing, I think, um, I've always been inspired by urban wildlife as well as over the hills and far away. I'm lucky in that I do wildlife surveys in what I would think of as perhaps the wildest land in Britain, in the North Mainland. But I also relish uh, inner cities and always have done. And through that, I've been very aware through the years of the way that the Scottish Wildlife Trust has really championed species conservation, landscape scale conservation, and big thinking about big processes in both urban and rural areas. We always have done through those decades. We, I think at the moment the indications are that we're continuing to do that 
in grand style and continuing to evolve as an organization. And personally, that's the most important thing to me in terms of my own involvement. It's an organization that doesn't just rest on its laurels, of which there are, are many. Um, it actually thinks, how can we do even better? And at a time of climate and biodiversity crisis, then the role of NGOs is greater than it's ever been in terms of championing right thinking and connection. Joe Pike, our chief executive, and myself were having a discussion with Liz Bonin, one of our keynote speakers this afternoon, just last night about this very thing, that um, our role is ever more important. I think you've only got to look at the political nuances, if that's not a too polite a word, of some of recent Scottish government decisions to see that actually uh, people power still counts a lot and you cannot re rely on the politicians to always do the right thing by nature. It's a classic case recently of a disconnect between nature funding and thinking about other things. It's as if nature is still the kind of optional bolt-on um, that can come to, you know, if you've got the money to do it, then we'll build in nature. But of course, for us, as the Scottish Wildlife Trust, it's fundamental that we have joined up thinking and the, sometimes the lack of joined up thinking is very, very obvious at the highest levels of government, which means that they need us we, to actually chivvy them all the time to actually make those connections. We're absolutely not there yet in terms of how we're dealing with nature being part of our lives. And that's something which I personally have felt through the, the decades that um, it's really important from your own passion, from your personal passion, to say, no, this isn't good enough. We're not actually hearing what our you know, elected representatives always are saying to try and get re-elected. We actually need to tell them how it is. And we're, like most countries, far, far, far away from making the connections that we need to do that something like recovery of nature, for example, is not seen as a luxury. It's seen as absolutely fundamental as part of planning and funding and action, whether you're in a village or a city or across whole landscapes. We're not doing that yet and we need to. And our, seen, our team within the Scottish Wildlife Trust, whether at local level, whether right through to senior staff level, are really aware of that and they absolutely champion that sort of idea to keep on keeping on um, and keep basically keep the faith because as the world appears to go to hell in a handcart in some ways, then actually having some hope is one of the most sensible things that you can do. Despair and negativity gets you nowhere. You know, that's as ridiculous as completely fluffy optimism about everything. Neither of these things will get us forward, whereas reality and passion and practical action will. And that's something that I've learned through nature conservation in general through the years, and I've learned it in particular through the ways that the Scottish Wildlife Trust has done things. So I could go on, obviously, all morning about that, but we're here for very formal business of the annual general meeting of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and I'll need to switch now um, to that part of uh, the business where actually... Although it's very formal, those of you that have been to these gatherings before will know that there's you know, a huge um, part, a lot of interest will come up on, on these slides fairly soon. So I see, yep, that's actually done it. Oh, magic, that's really good. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm still in awe of technology that works. Um, you have to forgive me, it's my age. You know. um, so first part of the morning, you will have the formal business. Um, and then there'll be opportunities during that to ask questions of our senior management team who ranged out um, along the front bench here. So um, we don't have an, a, another front bench to face them, luckily. You know, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet here, you know, not thinking of House of Commons. Um, and that will be followed by a film on our Next Door Nature project, which is a really exciting development, actually. And then after lunch, we'll... Um, be having a discussion with our guest speakers, Liz Bonin, that will be known to you from her TV work in uh, many different ways, including the, the watches in the past. Although I was intrigued to see that Liz actually way back 
was a co-presenter of Top of the Pops. So I deeply envy her that, because it used to be an ambition of mine to try and get on Top of the Pops. I never did, but, you know, um, <laughs> I had a friend that did. But <laughs> anyway, and Cal Major, who, if you're not aware of who Cal Major is, then she's the remarkable young woman who, believe it or not, has paddleboarded all around Britain. I mean, speaking as somebody who finds it difficult to stay upright on a paddleboard for more than a few seconds, then uh, my, my respect for Cal is huge. So she's a campaigner uh, who really draws attention to marine conservation issues, has her own YouTube channel and things. So it's going to be really, really interesting from both Liz with a perspective from the Wildlife Trust and internationally, and Cal from knowing how it is um, on the water, and probably for her, not very much under the water. That'll be um, followed by the Trustees Awards for volunteering and a special panel discussion about the Scottish Wildlife Trust time capsule. So again, over those years, you'll all be very familiar with Doctor Who. So you know, don't, um, don't worry too much, the time capsule will work, we're assured, but there'll be a lot of discussion about what's going into this time capsule. So watch this, watch this space. It's going to be fun, and there'll be discussion about people pitching ideas about what they should put in the time capsule. Um, OK, um, so we'll move now to, I'll, if you'd put on a very serious face, and I'll welcome you formally to the 60th Annual General Meeting of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So this meeting gives you, as members, the opportunity to scrutinise the main business of the Trust, to influence its governance, and of course to ask any questions about the running of the charity. Uh, we've had one or two apologies, which I won't go through, but they've been noted. Um, so um, we'll, this is the recap of the running order of things here. So we'll be approving the minutes, receiving the report, appointing auditors, electing members. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll try and, um, yeah, be very personal with the microphone here. So um, is that better there? Oh, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Apologies if you weren't hearing things earlier. I didn't realize. Um, so this is the running order of, of things there. Um, and uh, first off, I think all of you that wished have had the opportunity to scrutinize the minutes of last year's a AGM, which was held on the 9th of September in Aberdeen. Um, and you should all have had the opportunity to access the draft minutes on the websites. So first off, I need to ask, does anybody want to put forward any corrections to those minutes? I'm not seeing any um, hands going up, so we can accept those. And um, can I have a proposer that we accept uh, the minutes as a true record? Anybody want to propose? Yep. And for the pop. Could you say what your name is so that we can record? Catherine Wake. Thank you. Um, and a seconder also. That's great. And could you say your name? Because it, from here it's difficult to see. That's great. Paul Pia. Thank you. Um, I'm only looking very casual on the side of the lectern here because actually with the arrangement of the microphone it's very difficult to do it otherwise so unless I'm doing that I have to kind of be you know holding forth as if we're talking in the bar which we may do later of course but um, right um, senior management team have confirmed that there are no matters arising as a result of um, the minutes so we've had the approval there I should have had that on longer because it's a very, very lovely image, isn't it? Um, and <laughs> now, um, this isn't a picture of the people we look to for our accounts. I think unless we were big in international fish trading, it probably wouldn't apply. But anyway, a very nice grey seal. Um, so, yeah, senior management team have confirmed there's no matters arising. 
So we'll move on to receive the Council's report and accounts for the year ended 31st March. And, uh, you know, my own first year chair has been as busy as these years always are for Scottish Wildlife Trust chairs. And um, as well as thanking the network of members around the country, including yourselves, for your unstinting support and the inspiration that I get from different parts of the country, I'd like to give particular thanks um, to the senior management team in the front and to all the people, including Claire at the front, um, who has pr have provided just amazing service through the year to make my job much, much easier. I would be here, there, and all over the place in terms of my diary, for example, if it wasn't for people on the administrative side of the trust making sure that I don't wander off into brambly briars and general thickets that way. And for the senior management team, then it's always inspirational to be able to share ideas with them in between meetings as well as to see how efficient they are at servicing our meetings because um, there's a lot of business uh, to get through. So in my own role, I've had oversight of council and its committees. Um, and uh, sometimes, some weeks like this one, that can be, you know, a lot of meetings, um, but very, very um, valuable. This week, and this isn't the context through the whole year, but I think, for example, this week, up until this weekend, I've had something like five um, different Wildlife Trust linked uh, meetings, large and sometimes smaller. But don't worry, we're, or maybe you wouldn't worry, but you know, that's not the course during the year. So um, looking over that year, we've celebrated many notable achievements. And this is where you'll see quite a variety of, of wildlife and people. And for example, we've um, improved the space for native wildflowers at Gordon Moss Wildlife Reserve in the borders in order to provide habitat for pollinators, including the small pearl-bordered fertility butterfly. And I won't delay us by asking for hands to go up to say how you actually distinguish between small pearl-bordered and pearl-bordered, because that's for the butterfly nerds in the audience, of which I know there are several. Uh, but it's one of the fascinating aspects of identifying Scottish wildlife. How confident are you about identifying a small pearl-bordered fritillary? Um, look it up later if you don't know. It's really rather nice, actually, and it's very beautiful. Um, Hand Island footpath um, was completed with upgrades after 15 years of work, ensuring that visitors are able to enjoy the internationally important population of seabirds there without damaging the surrounding habitat. Um, it's a great place, not just for puffins, which tend to steal the, the show a bit as the ones on the great stack there, but it's one of the most important guillemot and razorbill colonies in the whole of Britain and Ireland. Um, and even speaking as a puffinologist, um, you know, my PhD included puffins, um, I still think that the guillemots and the razorbills somehow get a bit of a hard time of it with the puffins kind of being there and looking very puffiny. Um, and you've got this amazing colony of guillemots and razorbills, which is of absolutely international importance in a way that actually the hand island puffins are not. I don't want to, I'll, I'll stop because I don't want to diss the hand of puffins. They're, re they're really good puffins, but you know, okay. Um, so food for thought anyway. Um, I know my old friend Tim Burkhead has railed for years about too much looking at puffins. Not enough at guillemots, but... Um, so, looking at practical side of things, we removed diseased larch um, from our Air Gorge Woodland Wildlife Reserve in, uh, in Ayrshire, not surprisingly, to re-establish native woodland and improve the connectivity, ecological connectivity in this uh, ancient site. And tree disease, obviously, is something which, sadly, we're trying to cope with um, as a nation um, across the board. There are many diseases that have come in now that are very, very worrying, ash dieback being another one. Um, and that, of course, has um, implications for the trust in terms of um, expenses that might not have been visualised a few years ago. They certainly are now, but costing that in to our work programmes is 
not an easy task because it's also not cheap very often to get these things out. And with international connectivity in um, tree trading, if you like, then that's something that's not going to go away. Um, and we launched the new community action website featuring a resource library, which is worth looking at, and a series of case studies showcasing examples of community-led action for nature in Scotland as part of the Next Door Nature project that you'll hear more about um, before too long. And we delivered a program of community training and events promoting sustainable and nature po positive crofting and grazing practices in Koiga Khanasant, where, as you know, we've been involved for uh, years really as the, um, the lead partner in the Koiga Khanasant Living Landscape project now being concluded. Um, but that project, not to put too fine a point on it, probably wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for a large national organisation such as the Scottish Wildlife Trust coping with the financial roller coaster that you get through things like the old um, leader program, much missed now, but some of these programs that are designed to enable community action bizarrely um, actually rely on big organisations to carry the cash flow problems that come from big gaps between report and grant funding, etc. So congratulations to everyone, including Sarah Robinson as our conserva uh, conservation um, manager who made that possible. Um, and now following on from that, we're certainly um, hoping to develop our work you know, more in the Northwest as and when we can. Um, and we celebrated winning the health and well-being category of the 2023 Nature of Scotland Awards from, uh, for um, Whispers from the Woods and Wilds, uh, which was part of a partnership project with Scottish Badgers. <coughs> Speaking of somebody, all of whose strawberries got eaten by badgers this year, um, interested in how you form part. Uh, but anyway, I, I won't go into that. Right. <laughs> anyway, good on Scottish badgers. And, you know, I, I do love badgers, but I wish they'd left just some of the strawberries. Um, and, um, yeah, maybe I didn't put that one. And we recorded the first um, sighting of a Chetty's warbler at Beamerside Moss Reserve near the River Tweed. So that suggests that Chetty's will be, is making its way north. They're incredible little birds, and those of you who know them from probably south of the border know that their call just explodes out of a bush. It's, it's suddenly you're walking along, you know, looking at the clouds and things, and suddenly you get this blast of chip, 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 things, and you whoa. Um, so that should be happening probably in places near you before too long. There's expansion of various species going on, some of which reflects our steadily warming climate. Um, so um, as part of what's now been a project over uh, quite a number of years, we launched two new snorkel trails promoting sites in Fife and along the Murray Firth to encourage even more people to experience Scotland seas firsthand, in this case, under the water. I think the network is now pretty much complete and uh, there's really an impressive uh, number of snorkel trails there. So um, I'd recommend trying out um, as many of those as you want. You, you could tour Scotland now, actually, with Scottish Wildlife Trust-linked snorkel trails. Um, and that could be, it just struck me, that could be quite a good thing to do as long as you've got a decent enough wetsuit, because most of the year you're probably not going to be able to do much without. Um, anyway, snorkel trails, a big success. And we engaged young people in the marine environment in a different way as well through a series of events and by supporting um, youth attendance at the 2023 Sea Scotland Conference, which again was a, a very successful event. And our marine work, and we'll probably hear aspects of that during the course of the day, is really quite a significant aspect of trust activities uh, and stretches from the North Isles right down to the Solway, really. And we celebrated 10 years of the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital, for which the 
the trust uh, provides the Secretariat, with almost 150 members from many different um, sectors. The Scottish Forum is now a vibrant network of, of hubs uh, where people can collaborate, share information, knowledge. I know not everyone is always that easy with the term natural capital, uh, you know, doesn't like the idea that we should align monetary value with nature. But the real politic is that actually some people with a lot of influence over purse strings speak that language, and if you can speak some aspects of that language, then it works. And I'd only cite examples that I know within Scotland, where, exa where for example, very forward-looking planners who are switched on about natural capital have said, right, if we expand a woodland, um, make a river cleaner and more meandering and a footpath along this part of river in this town, then that will save local doctors X money, amount of money, it will save the NHS this through health and well-being, other measures that are put in, and surprise, surprise, money is made available for that. So I would say don't throw out the natural capital um, term just because maybe some of you don't naturally think that nature has that value. It does have its, its uses, really. Um, so, and we've supported participants from 26 areas of, of multiple deprivation to complete our Next Door Nature Pioneers program, providing them with the skills that they need to lead action for nature um, within their communities. Squirrels, another, um, it's, um, you know, I was maybe doing the wrong thing by my one of my favourite seabirds, the puffin, earlier, but obviously the red squirrel on land is, is a very iconic species, and most people love a squirrel, especially a, a red squirrel. Um, although in Edinburgh, there's a lot of people still uh, uh, like greys in places like the Botanics, but um, anyway, red squirrels, we secured a further £1 million for an additional two-year phase of saving Scotland's red squirrels that will deliver practical conservation work and enable development of new and innovative techniques to halt red squirrel declines. The Trust has been at the forefront of this, obviously, through SSRS, and our successes in places like the Dundee area are really, really um, significant. We completed an ambitious four-year Creating Natural Connections project as part of Cumbernauld Living Landscape, better connecting people to the town's green spaces, improving habitats for wildlife. Um, the scale of our thinking at an urban level within Cumbernauld is something which actually should be drawing attention across the whole of the UK for the way that we're making nature, nature networks a reality in um, what initially was an almost brutalist designed new town, obviously it's changed a lot since, but part of that change is um, due to the trust work. Hello, welcome, come in, hope you can find a seat somewhere at the, the back. Um, and we created more than 13 hectares of pollinator friendly habitat across 13 sites of part of the trust uh, led urban to Gurban nature network um, in Ayrshire. Again, a very innovative, very successful, very community-linked project that is producing lots of flowers through the season. And as you'll know, those of you that access to a garden, for example, then right through to this time of the year, our pollinators are absolutely desperate for something to get fuel from. So very, very, very important at a time of uh, pretty significant declines in pollinators. And we've made substantial progress in the development phase of the Riverwoods um, Blueprint project. So we've uh, launched the Riverwoods Showcase featuring a series of films to inspire landowners to take action. But there'll be a lot more happening on this front. Um, I should really, in context, say downstream, not, not far uh, away from, from now. So watch this space for some you know, um, inland blue uh, news, shall we say. We're getting back with some salt. Um, we engaged coastal communities with marine planning during 14 workshops held across Scotland and as part of our Oceans of Value project, which culminated in an event um, that were, various of us were involved in early in the year at the Scottish Parliament with uh, an MSP 
hosted event at Holyrood to launch that. Um, there was a film and community, and there were, there were people there literally from the Solway to Shetland. So there were seagrass planters from the Solway there. There were Creole fishermen from um, Orkney and Shetland there, as well as many of the other places in besides. Um, we fought once again, and we're still manning and womaning the barricades there to protect the, delic the sand dunes at um, Cool Links in East Sutherland by objecting to the second application for a golf course development there and encouraging members to support the campaign. This hasn't gone away. And the idea that, hmm, you know, an American billionaire developer, have we been there before, can um, think of potentially trashing part of the Scottish coastline for uh, their own gain for a golf course that is superfluous to golf requirements, as far as I can see. Um, and it's also in an area that's suffering from uh, fairly rapid coastal change. The idea that that can actually still stagger on through our planning system, costing NGOs such as the Scottish Wildlife Trust um, a lot of money um, is really not great. But anyway, um, through um, Bruce Wilson and others and our team, we'll be hanging on in there through the Conservation Coalition uh, about cool links and there's another um, hearing being held in November about this so um, anyway I shouldn't make my own political views known with this uh, a formal meeting but I think for the Scottish Wildlife Trust it's very clear where we stand on that we developed uh, helped to develop a new marine protected area which received over 2,000 signatures supporting the implementation of fisheries management measures within marine protected areas. A lot still to play for with that, a lot still to discuss about it. Designation doesn't mean protection necessarily always, as Cool Links demonstrates, it's got multi designations, but um, it's a step in the right direction. And we supported over 850 volunteers who delivered more than 29,000 hours of volunteering during the year. You can you know, while away the minutes thinking of what 29,000 amounts to in terms of months or years of work, but it's a lot. Carrying out tasks r ranging from litter picking, footpath maintenance, to growing sapling trees and monitoring seabirds. And we were honoured to receive over one and a quarter million in legacy payments, um, le legacy gifts through the year. Um, it's hugely valuable, and I mean that in the broadest sense, thing for people to do is to, to leave a legacy to the trust and we're notified by 46 supporters that they've chosen to include a gift to the Scottish Wildlife Trust in their will. It really does make a big difference to the trust's work um, and continues to do so. Uh, um, we've welcomed um, over 3,200 uh, new memberships to the trust so thanks very much to everyone who's done that. I don't know if there's any in the audience today but um, we really need those new supporters. Um, and I'd like to just thank everyone um, who supports us through um, both their um, financially as, as partners and, and funders. It doesn't really, you know, the scale, it should just be what people think is appropriate to them. Whether you're a big business or whether you're an individual, it all matters. So. Um, thinking with a financial hat on. Um, yep. Um, so that's a final thing here. Just thanks to everyone because it's not just the money, it's, it's the work on the ground. It's just the awareness of what the trust is doing. And um, that continues to make a huge difference. But thinking of finances, um, we're now on to that part of uh, the agenda. And I'd like to hand over um, to Martin Cullen, our Director of Finance and Resources, to summarise the financial position. Martin. Thank you, Kenny. Um, I'll try and adopt the bar lean, but if anyone can't hear me, just raise a hand or, or stop me. Um, so the technology should work. 
Okay, so I've only got a couple of slides. What I was going to do is, is talk over the annual annual report and accounts, which a link was made available on our website. Um, I, we had a we had a, a, a very positive financial picture this year. Um, our unrestricted surplus, which includes our designated funds, generated a um, 625,000 surplus. The year before was 750,000 deficit, so we've, we've recovered much of that position. Um, our restricted funds show a deficit. That in itself isn't, isn't a concern. Restricted funds are um, make up donations, legacies, grant funding. They come with restrictions, and so we take time to spend them. They can be for long-term projects. Um, what's more important is our unrestricted um, position. We, keep, we monitor that. Um, endowment funds we have, we're very fortunate to have two investment portfolios that were endowed to us um, a number of decades ago and what we see there is, is our investment returns and, and dividends used to support the activities in Cumbernauld and Irvine. Um, we've maintained a strong balance sheet and cash flow position as well. We've, we've ended the year and have much similar cash balance to the year before. Um, the year ended with a, a rate of inflation in the UK significantly lower than the year before, which was very welcome to see. Um, it's fallen further since the end of March, um, and um, that's also a, a very good sign for the future if that is maintained. Um, it will provide us confidence in the long term that costs will not be subject to sharp increases or volatility, and that makes financial planning much easier. Um, um, and along with that kind of cost stability, inflation stability we're seeing, um, we also saw our staff turnover rates kind of return to, to kind of longer term levels after COVID-19 COVID and and the pandemic, there was there was a, a lot of press about staff turnover ac across across the UK, really. Um, so we're seeing that that coming down, which is really good. Um, as Kenny mentioned, we've been really fortunate, incredibly grateful to receive a large number um, of legacies in the year of just over 1.2 million, and um, that compared to 400,000 the year before. That explains much of the surplus we're seeing. Um, um, Alongside that, we're incredibly grateful for the continued support from all our members and regular donors. Um, it's led us to, see, to um, achieve so much as Kenny, as Kenny ran through in those slides. Um, but it also provides us with financial security for future years um, to allow us to continue to work to achieving our goals set out in Strategy 2030. Um, if we look ahead, um, our five-year forecasts have been prepared um, with the focus of achieving these goals and our strategy, um, but also maintaining sound, robust financial foundations um, so we can actually be financially resilient beyond that strategy 2030 and have that long-term future. Um, those forecasts are supported by our, our free funds, by our financial resilience designated reserve as well. Um, and these reserves, these funds are really important to tell us to recover from kind of the long impact COVID-19 and these inflationary pressures have had. Um, it allows us to invest in fundraising activities and allows us to diversify our income, um, all with the aim to to be more financially resilient in the long term. Um, if we look at income in more detail, um, we we are still we remain really grateful for these subscriptions donations we receive each year. Um, it has been a particularly good year for subscription donations. Um, a, a part of that is we're very fortunate to receive a, a, a small number of large individual donations um, from persons. Um, which again it helps us with financial resilience and our, our long-term future. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the legacies were were, sig were significant this year. Um, they, they, will, they will fluctuate, and I think we we are very fortunate to have these gifts in people's wills, and we and and we plan accordingly and use and use them for for long-term um, financial planning. Um, we've also got significant funding from from various grant funders, um, totaling just over two and a half million this year. Um, we continue to be supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, the players of People's Postwood Lottery, Esme Fairburn, um, and a number, a number of other large uh, funders, including, um, for the first time this year, Garfield Weston Foundation, um, are, fun are providing grant funding for a number of years. Um, overall, our income increased from 5.2 million to 6.8. Um, what's important to split out there is there's, uh, we have our unrestricted income and our restricted. So unrestricted income um, increased almost a million pound, around around 30%, again, in large part due to legacies. Um, and our, our restricted income, um, that's grant funding, and we'll have legacy donations where people, people have put in a, a restriction, a, a specific request. Um, that rose um, just over half a million to 2.5 million, again, around 30%. Um, 
those sort of income levels will fluctuate year on year um, because much of it is related to projects. And as, as Kerry mentioned, um, the, our Common Old Creating Natural Connections project came to an end this year. Um, but uh, the really good news is um, we have obtained funding from the National Water Hedge Fund for the development phase of the successor project, which we're calling Nurturing Natural Connections. Um, so we're hoping following that development phase, we'll receive funding for a multi-year delivery project. Um, and as Kenny also mentioned, our Saving Scotland Red Squirrels, the, the current funded phase ended this year, but we're incredibly um, grateful that we can continue that project for a number of years, thanks to Nature Scott funding. Um, we also have two, as I, two other um, new projects this year of Next Door Nature um, and the development phase of Riverwood's Blueprint. Um, the, the trust is also conscious of these large projects that we do need to focus on the long term, look at its pipeline of large projects and what can be achieved after these current ones end um, and making sure the funding's there. Um, and that's really important to, to ensure the trust can to have a, a positive impact society on the natural world, maintain our profile um, and achieve our aspirations and visions and our, and our strategy to the ferry. Um, so looking kind of forward at our, our financial, um, our, kind of, our kind of funds, um, due to the surplus this year, our free funds um, are slightly above our, our target range. Um, that, that allows us to really plan better for the future and guard against financial risks, um, such as unexpected and adverse income expenditure events. Um, across the, in the next five years, we are expecting to use some of those refunds and also use our financial resilience debt into reserve um, to continue our existing levels of work to help achieve Structure 2030, um, invest in activities, and all this will mean um, a period of um, planned and budgeted deficits, and that's supported by um, these reserves we have. But the end, the end result being in four to five years' time that we do arrive at that financial res, um, um, stability of, of break-even position on our on our unrestricted activities. Um, it's very important to note that our financial outlook um, of these unrestricted designated funds, the remainder are close oversight by council and management. Um, we looked at looked at quarterly by council to ensure we are on track with our, our long-term plans. Um, and just a quick note on, on the balance sheet. I've not got slides on there. On our, on our balance sheet, um, our investment portfolios increased um, 300,000 to 5.5 million. That effectively recovered the losses last year. Um, we don't tend, we've, there's no real history of divesting investments. We just really use the dividends and we, and we spend those on um, the associated activities. Um, our bank balance, as I mentioned, has remained unchanged uh, broadly. Um, and our free funds um, is at the year end sent at 1.9 million, which is slightly over. The, the range we target, which is 900,000 to 1.6 million. Um, our designated reserves um, total 4 million. They exist for a number of reasons and they're ring fenced um, by the trustees um, for certain purposes. So key reasons are we keep funds aside to underwrite financial risk associated with major projects, in particular our living landscapes in Coyac and Asant and Cumbernauld um, and also Riverwoods Blueprint. Um, but it also allows, as I've mentioned, to forward to commit to ongoing activities, to commit to our strategy, invest in fundraising, um, rather than find ourselves cutting costs and fluctuating costs here and where we can maintain that kind of that that level that level of spending because we have these funds to support us. Um, um, and it's just really important to this, the trust and staff we continue to practically manage the activities and the finances um, and always remain mindful of our, our long term vision which is to advance the conservation of Scotland's biodiversity for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, and it really wouldn't be possible without continued support of, of members, funders, supporters, and um, the whole, the, the trust and members are, are grateful that we have that support um, to continue our important work. Thank you. You don't usually get applause for the financial bits, so thank you. <laughs> Well, it's always good when things are going up rather than in the other direction. So I think people are probably relieved by, by that. But uh, yeah, uh, as you'll see from that, um, a number of things, including individual membership subscriptions and donations, really do count in terms of those pie charts that you um, have just seen. Um, 
So our, um, okay. oh, it's a question, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. Thanks for that. Um, I think that there is there is a there is a connection. We have seen um, more fundraising effort with um, our fundraising staff and our, and our particular recruiters getting back on site and recruiting new members, and that comes with cost, um, and it does correlate to the number of new members, which Kenny alluded to in the slides, um, was more than the new members I had the previous year. Um, a bigger factor this year, though, in these subscriptions and donations line, is we did receive. A handful, I think two or three significant um, one off donations from individuals, um, quite large five, six figure sums. Um, what, I think two were unrestricted and one was restricted for specific work. Um, so that would explain a lot of that increase, but um, the fundraising costs have gone up and we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing some early dividends in that with the, re the recruitment of new members, um, the, the rate of increase um, trying, recovering back to where we were pre COVID. So the the question was that under some of the headings, uh, the lady here doesn't understand what some of them mean. So Martin, maybe explain. So those expenditure, um, the first five expenditure lines, they are directly linked to our strategy 2030. So our strategy 2030 has five high level goals and that is those five goals. Um, so we're presenting, and this comes from our annual report, um, we present our expenditure in a number of ways. So we um, show it by, by type of cost, like staff cost, office cost. But we, we also present it this way, which links to what we're setting out to do for the next five years, um, what's our activities, and the bottom line, as um, I remember mentioned, is our, our funders membership, which again, we're required to disclose that separately in our accounts. Um, so it's, try, it's really trying to link what we're spending to what we're trying to achieve in our, in our strategy. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to ask, this is the financial activity, the uh, income and expenditure. Does the trust have any idea of its asset value of its holdings? particularly in its nature as reserves, what, what, what is the value of your actual holdings? Just, just out of curiosity. I've got them written down there, if that would help. Give me a second. So, with regards to our, our land holdings, our reserves, um, what's important to note is we don't hold them at what the market would value them at. Um, they are what we classify as heritage assets, which is really common for charities that we, they're called heritage assets because we do not hold them for financial benefit. We hold them for societal gain, environment, our benefits that are the wider charitable benefit. Um, so what we do present in our accounts and our balance sheet, um, So we, we, have a, we have heritage assets worth just over £1 million, which represents the reserves that we own. We don't own all reserves. We lease some for, for our tenants. Um, that is our cost value. That's what we bought them for. It could be between 60 years ago and one year ago. Well, not one year because we didn't buy any. Um, that's cost. They're, they are arguably worth significantly more, but we don't see benefit in showing their market value because we are not holding them for financial gain. Does that help? One other question over there, and then think if it's possible, we might need to move on to the wider questions and answers. This is a comment rather than a question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a new member, and I'm a new member because I go to Craigie's Farm Shop, where, I, where, the, where, where someone was promoting membership of the 
of the trust. So I joined up then, so I would commend that as a very effective, proactive method of getting new members. Good, thank you. I think we'll probably need to move on time-wise, but we'll be having a question and answer session with our senior staff. Um, Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a good point. So would um, somebody like to propose adoption of the accounts? Yeah, there's a lady there. Could you say... Oh, sorry, the person there, not the person with the beard. What, uh, could you say your name? So, uh, Peter. Yeah. Peter Venturi. Peter Venturi. And could we have a second or over there? Yeah, thank you very much. So thanks for keeping us on track with that. And there will be opportunities during the day to have more questions. So um, our next part of the form of business is um, to reappoint uh, the auditors. And uh, Chain and Tate audited the trust for the third time this year, um, including a comprehensive audit. Uh, the findings report was provided to the Finance and Audit Committee and subsequently to SWT Council. The audit went very smoothly and that no cause for concern was highlighted. This provides assurance that the finances continue to be very well managed um, and our thanks to Martin, who you've just heard, and his team for all their work in this area, which is very, very substantial, and I can attest to that from the detail that Martin and his team provide to finance and audit and to council. Um, so could I request a proposer for this appointment? Uh, I know it's a bit, yep, again, Malcolm over there. Um, yep. Could you just say out loud so we've got it for the people online as well, sir? Yep, thanks. And a seconder? Um, yep, could you say your name, please? Oh, Paul, again, Paul Pia, again. Sorry, it's difficult for me to see from down here, so apologies for that. Um, okay, and now moving on to our elections from, to council. Um, as you know, um, unusually, because of quite a number of people that um, w were putting themselves forward for um, possible new election and also for re-election, uh, from existing trustees, we actually did, you know, we had a, a vote this year. Um, so now, um, without further ado, I can announce the results of that in no particular order, as they say, and, you know, the best of these shows, etc. But um, so in terms of our re-elections, re-elected for a second term, Chris Arnold, um, re-elected for a second term, Julian, Dr. Julian Cal Caldicott. Re-elected for a second term, Alistair McFitty. Uh, and that actually for Alistair forms uh, a, a, an election following and being co-opted before that. So um, welcome again to those existing trustees. And then for new trustees, elected Stephen Metcalf, Dr. Martin Murray, um, and Andrea Tomishkova. Um, so congratulations to all those new trustees. I haven't met you yet, but I look forward to that. And I hope your time with the trust will be um, as enjoyable as it is for other people who are already serving on the council. So thank you. Um, sorry? Um, I. I don't know if they're all here. Some of them are here, I know. So if you, there we are. Yeah, I think we've got one here so far. I know that Andrea and anybody else, any other people, this is your time for possible, you know, a few seconds of glory, even if, even if you're not that person. Um, I saw that the other night, actually. I, I, we, I must move on, but I must share this with you. I'd recommend seeing the In Conversation with Billy Connolly um, program that was screened a few days back. And that gave a clip from Billy Connolly on This Is Your Life in 1980, where within that, 
there was a clip of a guy in the Glasgow docks who was saying, oh, yes, I you know, worked with Billy and all the rest of it. Billy kept his mouth shut during This Is Your Life and said afterwards, I don't know who that guy is at all. <laughs> and he genuinely didn't. It was just somebody that got filmed. Anyway, right, nobody's taken that um, opportunity. So, um, and I also want to say thank you to our four council members who are stepping down today. That's John Morris, Anthony Robson, uh, Jane Stewart-Smith, um, who've made very, very large contributions to council and committees during their term. So um, thank you for that. And we're also saying goodbye to our chair, vice chair of local groups, Dr. Tim Duffy, who many of you know in the audience and has provided many years of service to the trust across lots of different aspects, including volunteering, um, time in the Conservation Committee, and Tim also is one of the uh, only people, in fact, the only person that I know who uh, has visited all the Wildlife Trust reserves in our portfolio that was mentioned earlier. Um, so, um, briefly, if we could, if there are further questions um, from the floor, um, this is the time to have that. Um, Oh, sorry, I don't know if the details of that. Have I skipped something here? Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, and do we need to say what these are, or just people have had an option to? Uh, Yeah, it was basically for those of you who couldn't hear, we've, had, we've hiked the subscriptions a little bit, but that's in the context of there's been no change for quite a number of years. So in order, aside from anything else, to keep pace with inflation, um, they have to go forward. Um, so is this something also that needs a vote on it? <clears throat> yeah. So, yet again, um, could somebody propose acceptance of the subscription rates that hopefully you've been able to, to see? Um, over the, Linda, over there, is that a proposal? Yeah, it's a Linda Rosborough, and a seconder. Um, and there, but could you say what your name is? Sir? I think actually there's a chap bef behind you that was first to. Is that Kevin Maxwell? Baxter. Baxter, right, thank you very much. Sorry, there was a, a competition for seconding there. It's, this is getting more exciting by the, the minute, actually, so who knows where this will end up. Um, right, um, and questions from the floor. Um, are there any questions? For the ones, have we had anything online at all? Yeah, and there's somebody there. Is that that lady there? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so the senior staff team is just going to be um, occupying the seats at the front there. So hopefully, yeah, so first lady there. The, uh, the cool links question is being taken up by the government now, I believe. Um, and, uh, if you have written in against it already, do we need to write in yet a another time uh, to the government or is our earlier uh, objection sufficient? Marlies, Bruce has got the very most up-to-date information on that. Uh, Bruce, do you want to pick up on Cool? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think there's a few questions that have come in Cool Link, so I'm going to sort of answer quite generally if that's okay. First of all, it is always worth writing to your local MSP and the Scottish Government with any concerns that you have environmentally. I can't stress that enough on, on any issue. So I absolutely would write to the Scottish Government and, um, and you know, make, make your, uh, your views clear. Uh, there's a wealth of information on our, our website on the Cool Links section. So yes, please do that. Just as Kenny mentioned where we're at in the process, the, the applicant has been, for, for quite legitimate reasons, being granted, a, a, I think, a, a, a week's extension. Um, in the current process that we're in for submitting documents. Uh, as part of the Conservation Coalition, we have reviewed all the documents put forward and submitted our, our own evidence. November, the, I think, 11th is the, is the kind of when the, when the thing kicks off properly in person in, 
in the uh, village hall there, so um, that will be the next kind of real point of um, focus. Uh, and, and we have previously, um, you know, through legitimate channels, made our, our views known uh, quite clearly to the Scottish Government and just our frustration that this is almost a carbon copy um, of the last application submitted again, which has taken up a lot of time, effort and energy for a site that, that should be highly protected. Just to mention that Bruce is our head of policy at the Trust. Mm. I think there's some other ones. Anything? The, we did have some online questions as well. Oh, somebody at the back. Yeah. Uh, Tre Trevor Woodford from Angus and Dundee Local Group. Um, whenever I have uh, commented uh, about planning applications, I've always um, been aware of how um, effective the uh, expertise of the trust is in um, commenting uh, on the um, uh, technical knowledge. Um, I, what I would like to ask is um, uh, it would be useful to um, say how um, large uh, the trust is now and I wondered how effective are you in retaining all these new members because we see uh, figures for new members but we're not sure how many we're actually retaining. I can take it. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's a great question. We've got a good retention rate and we work really hard to retain members. There's always a turnover in every charity like ours. Uh, I don't know the exact number yet, but it's usually something like 10%, um, which is fairly normal. And we benchmark that against other uh, organisations. Quite a lot depends on uh, how we communicate with people when they first join. But then, of course, our communications like the magazine and so on. We also do campaigns where we sometimes phone members. So overall, we have a, a good retention rate. It is sometimes affected by how people join. So when we start experimenting with new forms of recruitment of members, then some of those methods do tend to have lower retention rates um, than, than others. But again, that's, that's normal. So a lot of work goes into that, and I think we're in a, a good place at Can the I moment. Just Guys, come in and add. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think what we also do is we we, we benchmark and we, we see what the wider world of trusts and where available the wider third sector, what their retention rates are with memberships, and we are we do track slightly above that, which is good. Um, and I think I mentioned about um, investment, fundraising, and diversification, and, and part of that is seeing what what methods of of um, of um, obtaining new members and also maintain their membership, what methods are more effective. So we are actively looking at, you know, you know, phoning existing members, um, doing online, doing um, and doing new initiatives. Um, as a chat mentioned there, but you know, we create, you know, visitors at Craigie Farm will have our recruiters there sometimes and that's a that's a big method we use to recruit members, but we, we do look to diversify to see what's what's effective and what what we could do that's new. I think the question was how many members do we actually so, uh, what's the what's the current number? Forty-two thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. I know we've got <clears throat> a couple of questions that were online, although one of them I think could be asked in person. To, um, yeah. Okay. Um, It's obvious from today's reports that the Trust is doing a splendid job, but is there anything the Trust could be doing better? <laughs> Probably lots of things. <laughs> One of the Trust's six core values is that we're always learning, and we do try really hard to keep ourselves on our toes to see what are we not doing that we should be doing, what are other people doing, um, better. I think, going back to the planning point that was just made, we do recognise there's probably more we could be doing to support our expert planning volunteers, and we support them already, but it, it's an area where we'd love to have more capacity. 
And I think I remember, I don't have the note here, unfortunately, but there was, some, there was a couple of things that were in the online stuff. Uh, I wonder if the senior staff could look. Okay, I'll, I'll just choose uh, one of these. So th there's uh, a question about Cool Links. Uh, Bruce has already covered that. Uh, so Peter Gossip from Edinburgh asked, why do we not come across birds that have died? Uh, so Sarah might want Something to take that Sarah. one. Yeah, sure, I can take that one. Um, I, I mean, many of you in the audience will perhaps be more expert on this than me, but from my perspective, it's, it's mainly because sick and injured animals often seem to seclude themselves away to, to die. So they'll, they'll be hidden under undergrowth or they'll be in places that we won't be able to see. But also, um, we have a healthy population of scavengers who will deal with the bodies before we get to them or before we see them is, is probably the main reason for that. Thank you. So that's a great question. Any more from the others? I can read maybe one more from here. I'm conscious of time because I know that we've got to uh, break for lunch and we've got a short film to show. One more question? Okay. Uh, so there was one that came in about culling. Um, what is the current view of the Scottish Wildlife Trust on numbers of licenses provided by Nature Scott to cull protected wildlife in Scotland? That is, does the silence on this publicly mean they have no comment to make? Um, are there any professional conflicts of interest in this regard? Um, so we, we've certainly never been uh, against uh, culling. We often think of that as a, a last resort. Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to say um, any more about that? Yeah, I could put it in the context of beavers where mm. we are constantly challenging the government about their culling licences in this space and one of the reasons they're, they're sort of saying they're still necessary and, and we do support the mitigation hierarchy that Scotland have for managing beavers returning to the landscape. Um, they say there aren't enough translocation sites to put captured animals into um, so sometimes they have to take the last resort option, which is to cull the beavers. So we're trying to, and um, challenging the Scottish Government to, to use all public land that's available, that's suitable for beavers, and translocate them into that land, but also as a landowner and um, as part of a group of environmental NGOs that own land, we're seeking all the time to find new translocation areas to put the beavers into. So we are challenging. Um, some of the culling licences and it's not something we want to see but we do also understand that we live in a landscape where lots of different activities need to take place and on occasion licences need to be issued. Yeah, I'm okay. yeah, conscious of time, sorry. Yeah, thank you to N. Duncan for that question by the way yeah. and thank you to Sarah. Um, I think we'd probably better move on. Well, if there's one quick one there, I need the microphone. Apropos of what you've just been saying, I strike me there's a huge imbalance between the raptors that are heavily conserved and the small birds that are not conserved. And also, there are so many gulls everywhere, and they seem to be sort of, um, they're very preserved too. So what does, the, what, does, what does the panel think about that? Do you want to take that, Sarah? Yeah, it's a bit of a challenging <laughs> um, one to provide it. Yeah, I think, I think we're, some of the imbalances you describe or some of the different ways we're approaching the management of animals, I, it comes from all sorts of places. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're living in a time of great change, and so we're seeing some of these um, species in abundance and others that have been persecuted in the past still requiring protection. I don't think we're able to shift the sort of legal frameworks at the time scale of change we're seeing at the moment, but equally, um, I would advocate for all um, wildlife to be protected on some level um, and respected, uh, certainly. Mm. And of course, the context for large gulls is that they're in considerable decline. So um, you may think that, and there are a lot of gulls around in cities, but actually, for most of our species of Laris gulls, they're in considerable decline and actually have nothing to do with um, the demise of songbirds, which I think was, it was more to do with where songbird corpse, corpses or things go rather than you know, an imbalance. I think we really, if, if there are other things that you want to raise, then the, um, the staff will be around through the rest of the day. And sorry to cut this short, but I think I, I maybe need to say, you know, call our people at lunch 
so to speak, and you know there'll be lots of opportunities to chat and find out more. So for now, so I'm not bad pun, but eating into your lunch too much. I need to move on to our uh, next door nature, which is only five minute film presentation. But first off, I'd like to thank our senior staff team who I didn't introduce when they uh, came up um, there. So Joe Pike uh, over at, at your left, Rashir Shah is our Director of External Affairs, Sarah Robinson who's our Director of Conservation and Martin Cullen who you knew from earlier as our Director of Finance and Resources. So thank you to all of them. Um, And that includes for your work through through the year. And actually, thanks to uh, to Bruce um, on uh, the po the policy side for um, both answering the cool links question, but also holding the fort in so many different ways in terms of our uh, liaison with government. So next door nature is five minutes. Uh, then there'll be just a brief housekeeping announcement, and we can go off and eat whatever you uh, choose to eat over at lunchtime. So I think we need to switch now to the next door nature film. I don't know how that's done, but do I, do I do that? Oh, right. Okay. So, and I just, and again. Next Door Nature has been a two and a half year project to enable people to lead action for nature within their communities. At the heart of the project is the Next Door Nature Pioneers Programme, a free skills development course that gives participants the skills, the knowledge and the confidence to lead action for nature where they live. Across four cohorts, we've supported people from 37 communities across Scotland to complete the Pioneers Programme. We cover a wide range of topics in the programme, from basic wildlife ecology to how to survey habitats within a community area, as well as things like how to run a community event and how to seek funding for projects in the future. Each cohort has lasted six months and during this time our pioneers have completed a series of online modules, they've had an opportunity to attend a series of webinars and come to meet in person and find out what other community groups are getting up to. They've also been supported to engage with their wider community and to undertake a first project that will benefit both people and wildlife in the areas that they live. Grantland Gold Screener is an environmental project based in uh, north of Edinburgh. We do some uh, rubbish picking events, uh, we do plant swaps. So I heard about the Next Door uh, Nature Pioneer program uh, from a friend. I've learned so many new things and it was also quite practical and interesting. So for example, we have some lavender and other herbs sponsored by the Pioneer program. I've been working in this uh, multicultural area. Simple mindful activities like uh, working in the community garden is bringing people together. As a Korean from Burma, we are very close to nature, that's why I get involved in next door nature pioneer so that I can learn more how to take care of it, look after it better. If we take care of it, then they will also take care of us. So for a community garden here, we plant vegetables, then we also have co-op for chicken. Children love to look at the chicken. The program allowed us to apply for some budget that we can do something for our community. We thought about making one race band. We have a lot of people, sometimes they want to help, but they can't bend down very well or squat down. So that's why I thought that maybe we have race band for those people. I first heard about the Next Door Nature Pioneer Project from a colleague, and as soon as I began to read about it, I thought, this is what I need. And it's been learning from people who've already set up initiatives and hearing their stories, finding out about the resources that are out there, People who have got together in the Scottish Wildlife Trust and, and made all this happen and connected us with so many other groups and, and inspiring people have just done a brilliant job. So I'm hoping that um, from this uh, programme I can use all the things and the knowledge that I've gained to help develop the outdoor space at the Scout Hall where I help with the cubs. I would say my advice if you were trying to set up um, an, a community nature project is to um, yeah, try and find as many like-minded people as possible. 
and uh, talk to as many people in your community as you can, but you know, you really need it to benefit local people because then they'll get behind it. It was last year we did the course. I gained quite a lot of knowledge. Volunteer at the Tampa Hill Community Hub. Before we started this project, we wouldn't be able to walk through this place. Now we've got several paths open and a lot of people come through and every time they see me they're saying what wonderful stuff are you doing. I struggle with uh, depression but doing the wildlife stuff with the kids, that's put that one to the back burner. The day meetings, six of them, each one of them was at a different place. Each one had something really amazing that we could do. They're really on, on top of what needs to be done and they've got so much information, it's incredible. The experience has been really lovely. I am quite a shy person. I've had more confidence now. It's been really lovely to spend time with people who care about nature in the same way that I do. We have conversations about trees. <laughs> no matter what your starting point is and what your goal might be, I think you're going you're gonna to learn something. The online modules that have been developed as part of the project are now available for anyone to sign up to. So our hope is that the project's legacy will continue far beyond the end of the project. Communities have a key part to play in recovering nature across Scotland. So our hope is that what we've developed through this programme will help more and more communities take action for nature where they live. <clears throat> and congratulations to Pete Haskell and his team who have developed all this and you saw Pete at the end. I'm actually just going to steal the mic for one minute. This was a, a preview of this film. So to caveat, the resources are not yet available, but they will be as of October, which is when this film will launch. So before you all dash to the website to find them, uh, yeah, you have to wait just a little bit longer. Thank you. It's always good to keep things on tenterhooks. There is, uh, but uh, no, congratulations. It's going to, it's, as you can see from that, really, really good. Um, so I'd like to ask Rashir for some housekeeping arrangements before we can break for lunch. Yeah, so uh, building on the good news, I can say that the lift has now been fixed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so lunch uh, and the information stalls is in the same place you had your coffees earlier. Um, and if for those of you that weren't there, for that, the easiest way to get there is not actually to go out into the main, or, uh, main area of the museum, turn left and get the lift, but to go up these stairs and just go to the right there, and then you'll get straight there. So the best way is to go up these stairs to the right of the auditorium up here. Um, just so you know that uh, the family activities are taking place between 11 and 1 uh, and between 2 and 3 and they are on level 4 uh, as I mentioned earlier but if you have any questions just ask a member of staff we're all wearing these uh, lanyards as well um, just so you're aware all the food for lunch is vegetarian but if you do have any special dietary requirements just inform the catering staff there who will advise you uh, but also please note you can't bring any food and drink into the auditorium here while you're out and about, um, feel free to kind of visit the information stands. Uh, there, there's some very interesting and exciting things to, to see there. Um, staff will be on hand to answer questions, and um, they will go back to the stands during the break. So you, if you don't get a chance during the lunch, you can visit them during the break later on as well. So back at 1.15. Thanks again, everybody. And thank you all for your attendance today. So. And I should say, when we're back, uh, we'll be starting off with Joe Pike, our chief executive, who will be looking to the future. So apologies that we've lost a wee bit of your lunchtime, but I hope you um, have a good lunch. Yeah, thanks for because I mean sometimes it's I know, easier I wasn't sure if it was work for that, but yeah.